face to face, hand to hand, film to film. Pervert, filthy, slimy pervert. <laughs> Welcome right. to the Film to Film podcast, where we are going to be talking about Tenebrae. I am joined here by my good friend Inyaki. Uh, I just wanted to greet you all with those very kind words. Uh, how are you doing, Inyaki? Doing all right. Doing all right. Uh, you know, don't don't uh, don't get me with a racer <laughs> <laughs> or or an axe to the head. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Although. <laughs> Um, the axe was the the person doing all those weird noises was not the uh, axe killer. Uh, oh, I guess he was. Yeah. Well, no, he he did use the axe for one kill, but yeah, yes, the, but the he, main axe killer. Uh, this is obviously a spoiler filled podcast, so we've already probably ruined the film of Tenebrae if you didn't realize that. Um, is uh uh is different than that. Um. But yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, so we're going to start off with our synopsis here. Um, visiting Rome on a promotional tour for his new novel, writer Peter Neal uh, is pulled into a murder mystery as someone familiar with his work begins a series of killings. While the police look into the crimes, Neal investigates on his own, aided by his beautiful assistant Anne and a tenacious young local named Gianni. I feel like that Gianni was an intern, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was an assistant as well, um, or like a local assistant, I think. Seemed like he was like a fucking kid. I don't know. Okay, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, oh, is is the uh, the thing accurate? I think it's yeah. accurate enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually cut off a couple sentences there because I I uh, didn't think they were necessary. Um, was, okay. Was, where, where do you get that from? Uh, either Wikipedia or IMDb. I always forget uh, which one. I mean, uh, usually you, it's a fast Google. What? You need to you need to give credit to the you know, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's bad sportsmanship if you don't. But uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so, what did you think of this film? Just a quick thought on this. Did you like uh, it? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Um, so this kind of has a reputation, uh, along with Deep Red, as being uh, one of the. Uh, ultimate giallo films one of the definitely most well known if you were to google giallo this would be um what definitely one of the first results that comes first so uh i'm going to ask you a question that i will give okay. you a moment to ponder on uh as i talk a bit um but is this the ultimate giallo um mm. and uh so this film uh, released 1982 um it's much uh released much far after Sorry, I, I can't speak apparently. It was released way after kind of the giallo boom, which was really concentrated in the early 1970s uh, in Italy. So 1970, 1971, 1972. And Deep Red was really at the tail end of that too. And that was released in 75. And so this is released in 1982. So it's much, much after that. And, and it's also after um, kind of the slasher boom too, uh, which was like in the early 80s, Halloween, of course, 1978. Um, so it's interesting to see this film as sort of like um, a uh, sort of like a post jolly or or post slasher um, uh, retrospective, or, or it certainly riffs on some of those uh, films. It also, in terms of Argento's filmography, we've watched everything he's done other than his random drama film um, to this point. So it follows Deep Red in '75, Suspiria '77, Inferno in '80, and this comes mm. out in '82. So it follows two sort of supernatural films that are really kind of loose on plot and really more of a sensorial experience and then we go into this sort of very uh almost meticulously plotted um uh jello film uh, okay so we're going to go back to that question inyaki uh hey how do, how do you feel like this is uh is this the ultimate jello film well james uh i mean yeah i guess so i mean if it, it's funny because we do a full a full um from the first film we saw which um the first Giallo film that we talked about, I'm, I'm forgetting the name now. Uh, the Girl Who Knew Too Much. Yes, The Girl Who Knew Too Much. To this, we're, we're almost doing it, making a full circle in the sense that uh, that one was all about like you know her reading Ag Ag Agatha Christie, wanted to discover what's going on. And now we're ending with you know uh, a mystery writer who, who wants to know what's going on based on his book. And uh, 
So, so yeah, you could say so. It's, uh, it's if you know if the genre were to close with this, this would be a really good closer in the sense that we we've we've done the entire loop. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I feel like this is a film that you can't have unless all of those other films, or at least a big chunk of those other films, came before it. Uh, in in a lot of ways, this is a film like if this were to just be released into a vacuum. Um, it would play very differently than if you're sort of aware of the giallo landscape. Um, one thing I do think is kind of interesting with this is that this film does often get recommended um, as sort of like an initial giallo. Um, mm -hmm. I actually kind of disagree with that just because I think this film has a lot more text and stuff like that. When you're more familiar with sort of like Argento's filmography, I think it's pretty clear that Peter Neal, uh, he's taking a lot of what's happened to him personally as a filmmaker and sort of his personal interactions with fans and stuff like that um, into that character as well as uh, just having some sort of background on Giallo, having seen at least a handful of these films, I, I think the film becomes a lot richer um, as a result. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or if you think this is, um, you know, this could be enjoyed as a uh, someone new to Jolly. I think, um, <clears throat> I, I personally think that it could go either way, to be honest. Um, what would, what makes this, what would, if you know this was the very first giallo film that i watch this would actually be a, be a very serviceable film to watch in the sense that then you know i will get the intro to all the best elements or all the known classic elements of a giallo um so in that sense i would say you know this could be a good intro because you get the the, the full picture in one go and then you know you can explore little by little all the other stuff if that's if that's you know if you're a movie nerd and that's and you're doing that kind of crap um, okay yeah that, i mean that's fair enough i mean i think on, on its own right it is uh, a pretty enjoyable film even if you aren't familiar with giallo sorry mm -hmm. i interrupted you no no yeah no that, that, that's it but yeah no, i i mean like Right. If you want to appreciate all the intricacies after watching tons of other Giallo films and also perhaps also knowing, you know, uh, about this director's work. Sure, this might not be the best first movie to watch, but I mean, I think it could work either way. It depends on on what the what 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 your goal is. Yeah, personally, for me, um I think in terms of sort of being sort of like the ultimate jolly film, um, for me, this is kind of like 1B. I would probably put Deep Red or something like that as 1A. Um, I think something like the look and feel of this film is pretty different from those sort of early 70s uh, Giallo films. Like this film is very well lit. There's a lot of like whites on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Rome looks totally different than it does in uh, most other Jolly, where you see more of like these Baroque uh, historical elements to it. Uh, Argento, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but Argento uh, has said uh, that he was intending this film to have sort of a futuristic look to it and sort Ooh. of representing a different side of um, of Italy than you would see where we're usually in Jolly kind of jiving into more of like the classical uh, older building structures, which I think are a big part of why I do enjoy those Jello. But this mm -hmm. film does have a very, very different look um, uh, than those films. I mean, I mean, this film... I mean, if we're talking about like locations and cinematography, if you will, uh, this film definitely shows you, you know, the, the modern Rome. And I mean, this is the part where, you know, I'm, I'm not, sh I'm not a purist. I'm not a, I'm, I, you know, I like watching movies. I'm not a, I'm not a, a professional critic and a, a genre connoisseur, if you will. Um, uh, what I will say is that, you know, if the classical like Italian architecture is a requirement for a giallo film, then yes, this is somewhat missing that because this, you know, like the, the, the buildings you see, the locations you see are, are modern. And by that, we mean of that time, um, but if you don't care that much about that, I mean, then this is perfect. And I mean, it's, and you know, if you're like a Europhile, uh, you know, you still will be able to um, enjoy that. 
because you still are seeing a film in Europe and not in your classic American setting. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I, I I say that mainly in the sense that um, I feel like the sort of more classic Baroque uh, look of most jolly, uh, like this this film stands out as being different rather than something like Deep Red is closer to the norm um, right. in that sense. Uh, so although, although Deep Red, I don't know how. I mean, Deep Red is a giallo film, but I mean G- Deep Red stands out. One of the reasons why Deep Red stands out is that. It does play with that um, supernatural concept, even though the film is not supernatural in and of itself. It plays with that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. this one almost feels more giallo because I feel like giallo is more centered in in in, in the real world, real world, in a little bit, a little bit. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it is interesting, and I mean, in some ways, Deep Red is. Uh, different than giallo too i think one interesting thing people talk about this film too is sort of that postmodern look but it's also sort of intended to show a rome with less people around Mm. Uh, like some people have said it's like post-nuclear disaster or something like that and i don't know about that uh but uh it does they do showcase um sort of italy that there's not a lot of people around but that's also true of deep red too mm-hmm. i feel like one thing that always strikes me with deep red is it almost feels very stage like even sort of like the exterior scenes uh mm-hmm. like that initial murder happens and there's hardly anyone around uh there and it almost feels like a stage even though i think it is actually on location um, so it, it's interesting uh, because most of both of them have this sort of like um, artifice uh, around it um, and they don't necessarily feel like urban and surrounded with people other than maybe the one uh, scene where uh, a character gets stabbed in the crowd. Um, right. and, and I think that's interesting um, about both of these films is there's like almost a sense of uh, uncanny and different to them uh, compared with other giallos that more capture sort of the hustle bustle of a city. Well, isn't it, I feel like Argento is, I mean, be, besides his uh, first two films or the ones that we watched. The first three, yeah. The first the, three. The Animal Trilogy. Yeah, besides the Animal Trilogy, I mean, all the other Argento films do have that uh, that feeling. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I wonder if, you know, this is more of an Argento thing, right? Uh, that Argento, I mean, it clearly seems that he likes to control to control what the, the camera shows. A crowded city does not allow for a director to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, by all documentation and stuff, he's, it sounds like he's, especially at this point of his career is a real control freak. So that very well might be part of his motivation um, there. And you're right. Uh, I think those first three films do still sort of stand out and fit more closely into what we think of as Jallo. Um, whereas like Deep Red and of course Suspiria Infernal and Tenebrae, I mean they're frankly strange, uh, mm-hmm. stranger films than uh, probably the norm at that time. Um, okay, uh, the other thing is I, I do think this is actually the first Italian film uh, we've done in the 1980s, mm. uh, so that's kind of interesting too. Um, the Italian film industry. Uh, kind of had a big decline in the 80s. And this is still in the early 80s when it was still going kind of okay, I think. Um, yeah, what did you did it feel like it was sort of in a different era to you or or is it kind of fit pretty cleanly in with the other films? Uh, a little bit with the hair, like the hairstyle. <laughs> uh, you know, you had a little bit of a, those, a little bit higher, the women were having higher hair, like with more volume, if you will. Um, Besides that, um, I mean, maybe, maybe you know that you're 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 mentioning on the lighting, uh, perhaps. But beyond that, it, I mean, it, it's like eighty one. So the difference between nineteen eighty one and nineteen seventy nine is right, right. Yeah, I mean, you're basically making eighties film. But most of the Jolly we watched, uh, Deep Red is the most recent one. That was seventy five. So this is seven years after that. Uh, it was mi- early to mid-70s. Um, but, but, I mean, outside of Giallo, I mean, we did watch Inferno, which was uh, 1979. 80. Uh, 1980. 80, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, his uh, Supernatural 2, the Inferno and Sus- Susperia, they have such a totally, almost timeless uh, look to them that they're very mm. difficult to tell, actually, when 
uh, they're set. Uh, it's like True. Inferno. Uh, Inferno, I mean, that takes place in New York, but that surely doesn't feel like a very normal New York film. True. True. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, and, and the other thing that I think really does ground it in the time um, that you didn't mention is the score. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, was that uh, Goblins? So, debatable. It is Goblin minus one person. So, in my opinion, basically Goblin, but in the credits it's credited as the three individuals that are actually ah. doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I didn't feel like it was that far off from the Goblin soundtracks that we've already heard. I mean, you know, like... <laughs> okay, fair, fair. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it does have a little bit more of a disco 80s feel to it uh, than those ones. Um, but, I mean, it certainly sounds like Goblin still. It's not like it's a like, totally different sound or anything like that. Yeah, a little bit more synth- synthesized. <laughs> synthesizer and a little bit less uh like prog rock i guess but i mean yeah yeah did you like the score i did i did it was quite enjoyable uh, okay and actually it was more subtle than uh in other films so yeah good although you wouldn't call it subtle in a vacuum would you no no <laughs> but it's more subtle than other scores by goblin yeah i i'm i'm a big fan of the score i think it's a really catchy score um mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're going to watch some uh, gruesome murders get placed, it's shown very stylishly, uh, you could do much, much worse. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, it's funny because this is one of, one of those films where, you know, we, we've discussed this before, uh, whether or not uh, uh, Jallo can be a form of horror film or not. And, I mean, I, I've been saying many times, yes, in a way, uh, you know. Uh, but for this one, the use of music was not horror-like. I mean, the, the, when there were some murder scenes, it felt more like an action film than a murder film because, you know, you, the music was more of, of amped for action and not horror. Yeah. You know, at what point would you say Argento, because his early films like Bird with the Crystal Plumage, I feel like that's a much more conventional use of music, wouldn't you say? Um, mm-hmm. w- what film do you think it really changes? Do you think it's uh, Deep Red or, or do you put it somewhere else? I think it's a good question. I, I think Deep Red, um, you know, you got, got the Goblin score, but the score itself actually works worked better, especially with the horror elements, if you will. As far as I remember. Um, yeah, I think that score is a little different. I mean, it's certainly different than the norm, um, but how it's used, I guess, is a little bit more conventional. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's a very different group than, of course, Ennio Morricone. Um, right. So maybe it's just this film. Maybe it's this film that it starts to feel. Uh, maybe it's just sort of that pulsating disco vibes that uh, makes it feel so different and more as you put it, uh, action oriented, Mm -hmm. um, than, uh, sort of like a horror score. You know what, what, what's interesting though, uh, like thinking about scores and I mean, at some, maybe at some moment in the future, we'll talk about hereditary. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, that film had a score that was extremely subtle, but it felt like a club. Remember? Oh man, I, it's it's been a while. I remember that film feeling really oppressive, and I don't. And I feel like the score felt oppressive too, but I actually don't recall it that well. Right, the score was just literally like, interesting, or something like that. Like, and it would go up and down, like you know, depending on the moments. But it, it and it was always present. And uh, what's interesting about uh, this one is that it. It worked a little bit like that, but not really, because this one was like, it was a happier score. <laughs> the score itself, I'm saying, like it was, uh, you know, you got you got some uh, major notes, you got a little bit of um, a little bit jazzy, uh, a little bit uh, disco-y, as you were mentioning it. So, in a way, it didn't jive with horror, but it definitely jived with action. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because in a lot of ways, and I'm taking this, I was watching um, an interview with a Argento, I don't know if they'd be called a biographer, but someone that wrote an Argento book, and she, uh, Maitland Donig, was saying that this film is very cold uh, compared to stuff like Deep Red, uh, Suspiria, and Inferno, and just like sort of that postmodern feel and stuff like that and just the way people are treated. I feel like the one aspect of the film that is a lot more on that sort of warmer, hotter feel to it rather mm-hmm. than that sort of like colder aesthetic is the score, um, that mm-hmm. sort of like pulsating beat. And uh, it'd be really interesting uh, if this film had been scored more conventionally, if it had more of a colder feel to it. Um, mm-hmm. But I almost feel like that score makes it feel like, t- tells you that like, hey, it's okay to have fun. And, and enjoy these murders. Um, and it gives a little bit of that Argento joy in it that you get from uh, these really gruesome deaths. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, you know, uh, since we're talking about the look of the film, uh, one thing I thought was really interesting um, is that the cinematographer um, is uh, Luciano Tavoli, who also did Suspiria, which couldn't look more different than this film. Oh my God, this yeah. Fil- this film is like very well lit a lot of it's daytime it does some of that like a lot of whites in it um Mm -hmm. whereas like Suspiria is just like overly saturated with color um what how how did you like um i don't know do you have any uh, thoughts on sort of the look of the film um some of the cinematography work or like how it fits yeah it was extremely lit everywhere like even the night scenes you know uh i mean with the night scenes, you knew that they they either had like hardcore spotlights on using a blue filter to make it look, look like you know night, or maybe they straight up shot during the day with a blue filter to make it seem like night. But in general, the the film was just extremely lit. Uh, in on you know there was very little. There was just very little mystery, if you will, on what you were seeing. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, the, I, I'm very surprised that it was the same person that uh, did Suspiria, because uh, Suspiria was, I mean, it was a feast of colors, and this one yeah. is this one is more, uh, you know, you you're working with pastels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this one it was like a lot of well lit. There was like a lot of like red blood on white walls, uh, mm-hmm. including one very memorable scene at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a little bit of a spray coming off just a little bit you know i don't think he overdid it at all it was very subtle uh are we talking about the arm (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. (laughs) very famous scene um and uh yeah it it looks very different and i think it it, uh, goes to show how talented the cinematographer is to sort of pull off these two very different looks did you like the look of the film i did i did um I also like the locations. I mean, like they, they chose cool build, build. They did, in my opinion, I really like the, that type of architecture that they used, especially the uh, the the design of the house of um, the two uh, women, the lesbian lovers. The lesbian lovers' house. I mean, well, that one was the the, the couple that the couple. Oh. They were a couple or like yes. open relationship or something. Yeah, their their house. That one was just a fun ride with the camera to look at the entire like layout of the house yeah um uh, yeah th- uh, but that was that's very argento i feel like uh in other argento films he does that too where he's like you know what we're just gonna go on a trip i'm gonna show you like walls and the corners and cracks of a house and you know little details that i think are cool that maybe you won't but i don't care um and, and that was fun. Like that, that was a very Argento touch, which you do not see on um, Suspiria, actually. But you do see in other films, like um, that sort of crane shot. You mean? Yeah, the crane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but I was thinking of the the the, the house of the um, uh, the um, the the critic uh, or the, critic, the TV yeah, show the, host. The the host, yeah. Yeah. The, the the very religious host, Cristiano Berti. Cristiano Berti, yeah, yeah. There you go, <laughs> Berti. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how the hell he afforded that house. Uh, maybe he had a very successful uh, daytime TV show. That was quite a house he had. Yeah, I feel like I mean, 
I feel I think he was supposed to be like a celebrity guy. Like even though all the scenes you would see him, he's just he looks like a fucking creep. Uh, apparently, I I feel like he's supposed to be a celebrity. Yeah, he. I mean, John Steiner, who plays that uh, guy, uh, Cristiano Berti, he was in a probably way more Poliziotesques than he was a uh, Giallo, mm. uh, and he almost always played uh, a bad guy. It was very rare to see him in any sort of good role. Um, he just kind of kind of has one of those faces that uh, it's very striking, and it seems just naturally very villainous. Yeah, I mean, this one he can, he just looks like a creep. I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. He, he does. <laughs> um, but you were saying about the uh, architecture and the look of oh, his house. It, 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 it's just fun to see those locations. Uh, it, it was fun to see, especially with those angles, like from above, you can see the entire layout. Um, so, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, that crane shot is definitely um, amazing and and. It's very showman-like and kind of like, look at what I can do. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very impressed uh, that this film came sort of after Suspiria and Inferno because it shows quite a range. Uh, it's like those films, I like them, um, and I don't give a crap about the plot, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, this film, I, it's so much more thought out uh, in terms of like plot and stuff like that, and the look of it is totally different. So I think going from those two films to this one, um, I don't know, it... it shows Argento uh, has more range than just sort of these supernatural uh, films that he's probably most well known for, especially Suspiria. Yeah. I mean, one <laughs> gripe if I have with this film, and I'm not sure if it's the acting or the directing, and this is the part where, yes, Argento is a great as a visionary of things, but, uh, and, and again, this might also be the dubbing. Who knows? There's three three points to perhaps blame but none of the act many many moments the acting the, the act the, the way that that the different people acted did not match what was happening it just never felt like many times it did not feel natural and it, it was even worse when their face was sort of smiling and their wo voices were whimpering and you are like, what the fuck is going on uh, in the acting? And I mean, this is probably, I don't know if this is something you wanted to talk about. But, you know, I mean, some of these actors, we've seen them already. Uh, you know, John Saxon. Uh, right. Classic horror film, you know, Dad. <laughs> yeah, or uh, Cop. Or Cop. Uh, here being an agent. And, you know, he, even he looked really bad in many moments. And um, and again, I, I, he he's looked good in other films, so I'm not sure if it was a directing there, but I want to say maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I mean that that's certainly a common complaint of Argento. Uh, I'm curious to hear what moments you picked out as being particularly bad. But, uh, I mean, I don't think in any stretch of the imagination even the biggest Argento fan would ever call him a very good director of actors. I think he's definitely more known for kind of what we were talking about, sort of the visuals and stuff like that. Uh, were there some specific moments that you found particularly uh, uh, LOL bad? Um, you know, I actually didn't write them down. I didn't write many of them down, but... Okay, so one example would be when um, after, again, this is all full spoilers, uh, you know, we find out that um, Peter is the, ac the actual killer, or mm -hmm. the, the, a killer, uh, you know, he kills himself, or mm -hmm. he pretends to kill himself, and then, you know, they're back in the car, and Anne is, is freaking out, and there were moments where, you know, she was kind of smiling, kind of not, looking straight into the camera, not very, you know. And, and I mean, you know, professional actors, every professional actor knows not to look at a camera. So it is, maybe she was directed to do that because she's talking to the detective. Maybe, you know, and, and it looks bad. Uh, and then the voices do not match, obviously, because she she kind of almost looks like she's not crying while the voices are crying. Now, that's dubbing issue. I, we did not watch the Italian version. If the Italian version is doing the same thing, then maybe the director's at fault there, too. 
Um, uh, another uh, other moments like that would be um, uh, Gianni. Gianni, when like there were many moments where, he, well, for example, his character has to act the most in, in certain situations because he sees uh, killer number one, uh, Cristiano, getting killed, and he's sort of dealing with that internally and. He goes between smiling and not smiling and just looking dumb. And again, maybe it's the actor. Maybe it, maybe it's not. <laughs> or when or when uh, when uh, John Saxon was you know dying in the middle of the plaza, there were moments again where he he wasn't sure what he, like you weren't clear what he was doing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, your point is well understood, and uh, uh, I don't have much uh, contention with it. Uh, yeah. he's, and I think it is fair to say, uh, given what we know, and as as Argento's filmography goes on, he doesn't get better with actors. If anything, he continues to get a bit worse. Um, he he is definitely not a good uh, dramatist. He is not good at provoking good acting in a way that like certain filmmakers that are actors, directors are, mm. um, you know, uh, the one performance I do think that is quite good in this film though, um, uh, is, uh, Anthony Francioska, uh, who mm -hmm. plays the lead of Peter Neal. I think he's, uh, very likable in the role. Um, and he, uh, he engages in a way that like, he's very engaging in a way that is not necessarily terribly common, um, for Argento's films. For instance, I just watched, um, Argento's Dracula 3D, for the first time that came out like eight or nine years ago and my god is that film dramatically inert it is uh it is the acting is is so bad uh and i watched that before i watched tenebrae so maybe in contrast tenebrae seemed uh, quite good uh but uh argento uh does not does not ever really improve in that sense but i think um anthony francioska and i'm going to credit the actor here as opposed to argento's direction of him yeah um i think he's very credible in the role he and is. he does a good job no he is he is and especially when when he's going between uh crazy and not crazy even there he is very uh believable so right yeah yeah some of the expressions on his face when he like cuts his own throat and stuff like that i mean I, I thought he did a good job of, mm -hmm. I mean, part of that is also he's acting within the movie, so he's hamming it up too, so I thought it was um, appropriately done. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the acting is certainly a weakness of this film, as it is probably for Suspiria and Inferno, uh, where, you know, <laughs> if, if you're ever desiring, I remember in Inferno, the guy kind of was like a poor man's Mark Hamill. And mm -hmm. Mark Hamill is not a good actor and when you're a poor man's mark hamill that means something has gone wrong <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know uh the acting is not good but i i i have uh very low expectations for argento's acting so personally it didn't bother me too much that's fair <laughs> um okay well uh you know we've talked a lot about sort of the style and stuff of this film um unlike a lot of argento films we've talked about i do feel like this actually has some very interesting text to jump into mm -hmm. um and talk about um just because uh yeah there's a lot going on uh in this film it's almost like uh there's a lot of doubles in this film it's almost like we get two giallos in this film we get a first one that's almost like the first hour with one killer um and then it's it's taken uh that killer gets killed uh although we're not sure that that's the killer uh and replaced by a second killer mm -hmm. and uh we have a lot of those jalo tropes and stuff like that going on um yeah did you find it to be uh how did you find that aspect of sort of like the double giallo uh uh approach to it did you did you find it effective was it different enough from other giallos Um, yeah, it was effective. Uh, was it different from other jellos? I mean, uh, the, the the whole double double switch or having one killer be having two killers uh, reminded me a little bit of the uh, the other one where um, blood and black lace. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, yeah, it, it works. It works. Um, uh, <laughs> 
You know, it's it's funny because like it works. It, it has a little bit of the mumbo jumbo uh, psychological explanation for the second kill, killer, which may or may not make it uh, weaker. But uh, but I mean, for the overall theme of the film, uh, which is, you know, it works. It, it does. Yeah. It, it goes into its full cycle. Uh huh. Yeah. I, the psychological mumbo jumbo. I'll be honest. I kind of like it. Um, it might be the uh, greatest moment of Rhode Island on film. Uh, you know, I can't think of any other Rhode Island movies. Can you? Um, plus, it has palm trees for some reason. Rhode Island. Uh, so there's that going as well, um, which I didn't know you could grow palm trees on Rhode Island. I don't think you can. <laughs> I think it was filmed in Italy. Um, I've never been yeah, to Rhode Island, so who knows? Maybe there are uh, <laughs> sand, yeah. like sunny, bright, sunny, sandy beaches. It's secretly Hawaii, uh, but they just don't advertise it. <laughs> I mean, Rhode, I- Rhode Island looked beautiful. I, I want to go there for you know a, a summer vacation <laughs> or winter vacation. It looks warm. Yeah, it looks very. It warm. looks su- surprisingly like Southern Italy, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, what did you think of the uh, flashback scenes to the, the woman in uh, heels and red heels? Um, they were interesting. Uh, I mean, they were effective for what it, I think it's sort of intending to show, right? I mean, I don't know, who was that woman? Like I, I understand, that's a woman who basically shoves her stiletto in, in uh, Peter's mouth. Understood that part by force, but that's after Peter like hit her for some reason. So, what happened? What happened through all of that? Like, I mean, I don't think the film really explains it. It's just more like, all right, this is woman with a bunch of young men. Yeah. One one I of mean, them hits her and then all the other ones beat the crap out of her and she kicks him too and then she shoves his hair a little into his mouth. Right. I mean, the assumption is that that's Peter Neal and then he was humiliated somehow by this woman especially uh, and uh, he eventually killed her. Right, right. But where did he hit her? Like at first? like. Um... I don't know that it's totally clear, but maybe probably jealousy of some sort. Oh, do you think maybe like, oh, like maybe she was like cheating on him and like sort of something doing like the, that, like some sort right. of like cuckold kind of cons kind of thing. I think that's the implication or if she was oh. mistreating him in some way. Um, it's never fully spelled out, which I'm totally fine with. I'd rather they not totally spell out the answers in some ways. Right. Because I mean, what triggers his, uh, his evil is the fact that he stabbed her. Yes, he stabbed her, and then these initial uh, murders that happen uh, kind of trigger him into, uh, uh, like, back into that mode of uh, killing, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually thought the flashbacks are well done. I kind of like that creepy kids music that's playing. I no, think no, they, they, they were. Sorry, I, I was probably thinking too much about uh, what was happening. But no, they were. They're, they seem, they're very dreamlike. And uh, and they are effective enough to do yeah. the job. Yeah, as far as like psychoanalytical explanations for why the killers go, I actually rank this one pretty highly as far as Giallo goes. Admittedly, the bar is not necessarily very high for a lot of Giallo films, uh, but what, I, the, I actually the like the three white this chromosomes one's character. were the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think you're adding a Y chromosome each time. It's gonna be I like know. five Y chromosomes. chromosomes. <laughs> It's like fucking makes you the Hulk or something like that. <laughs> the twenty Y chromosomes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That that's definitely ranks towards the bottom. Uh, the the chromosome ones. Uh, this one I feel like it's pretty good. Uh, mainly because it's it's clear that it's not necessarily the whole point, and I don't need it to be fully sped out uh, spelled out. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe our friend Nathaniel pr- would prefer that, but I actually don't personally care too much. Mm-hmm. So just having some sort of like creepy flashbacks that show and they get the point across uh, eventually. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think sort of like these meta elements and one reason why 
I would not say this is sort of the ultimate Jalo. Is I do feel like you cannot have Tenebrae unless you have sort of those earlier films that sort of this builds on top of. Um, and I think it's interesting, uh, sort of like the elements of it that are clearly inspired by um, Argento's own life. He talked about um, having a stalker in the past uh, and the person like giving him sort of creepy phone calls uh, that started out okay and gradually got creepier and creepier when he was visiting the United States, I think for maybe Suspiria promotion or something like that. Hmm. Um, and so you can uh, sort of feel that there. Obviously there's the other uh, part of just the obvious connection of the uh, main character, Peter Neal being an author um, who is basically the author of books that seem to be sort of the book equivalent of Argento's films in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of like a Stephen King crossed with Argento uh, as far as like a bestseller goes. Um, so I think those elements are also um, kind of interesting and like stuff like that sexist critique is clearly inspired by stuff that's been leveled like directly at Argento in the past. I, I figured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, did you have any thoughts on any of that before we keep going on? Uh, no, no, I mean, it, it makes sense. It makes sense that this was uh, sort of reflecting on his own work and or, or his own experiences. Um, it, it is funny because I, I, I was hoping we would have a little bit more of an exploration on the, on the critique, the sexism critique, but you don't really have it. You just kind of say like, Hey, your work is sexist. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it, his dynamic with her is actually very interesting because if you notice when they get off the plane, they're very friendly and cordial. And then, like, they sit down and then she immediately launches into that attack. And then afterwards, they, like, sort of have a more friendly follow up where they're oh, clearly yeah. familiar with each other. And it's sort of interesting just the way that they show that dynamic. Um, and I think. Uh, I, this is another thing that I got from sort of an interview, the interview I watched with Maitland Donog, um, is just sort of like the surfaces of it and how like Peter Neal on the surface is very a cordial, uh, very likable human being. Uh, but obviously uh, deep down he's harboring like this sort of like very uh, ugly uh, and murderous uh, emotions. Oh, okay. And, and sort of like Sack, John Saxon's character too. I forget his name. Um Bulmer, I think Bulmer. Uh, he is actually cheating uh, on them with uh, with Peter Neal's. I don't know if it's his wife or partner, uh, whatever. Jane. Um, so, yeah, yeah, Jane, exactly. And so all of these characters sort of have like these uh, surface level things that they're doing, but underneath it, there's other stuff going on. No, for sure, and I mean that's where all the characters are somewhat layered. I, I. With, with the journalist and uh, and like that, the uh, you know like her her aggressive position during the interview, but po pre and post interview uh, extremely cordial. I feel like I, I I'm curious if that's sort of also like reflecting on Argento's own experience in real life because I feel like that's what that's how journalists are in general. Apparently, like journalists are like super nice to you before and after an interview and yeah. that the interview is could go either anyway and then you see the uh piece published and it's like oh what the fuck happened there uh yeah yeah that makes sense i mean it feels like too rich of an observation to make uh for it not to be personal yeah in, in some ways yeah uh but uh yeah i i also think it's interesting how you sort of see multiple interpretations of work, which could also be seen as interpretations of Argento's work. Like we have the journalist Tilda, who uh, just calls him misogynist and attacks him um, for sort of like um, exploiting women uh, with violence and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we see also uh, the journalist Bertie, who sort of gives a very slasherish exp explanation for the killer, how he's rooting out corruption and he's killing like uh, the less... Um, I don't know the, the aberrations less, or yeah the the bad elements of society basically, mm -hmm. and he's like uh, killing corruption and stuff like that. And you also see that reflected in how Bertie is killing, how he targets like the woman that shoplifts, how he targets right. the uh, the two lesbians, um, which is fascinating and... in that in that like in that part where Neil 
you know, interrupts Bertie, literally telling him, no, no, like, uh, the, the killer is just a psychopath. Right. Like, like the people he's killing are actually completely fine. Like, in fact, uh, in his, like the lesbian couple in my book, they were like the happiest couple in the entire, like that you, in, in the entire like series or whatever, or something like that. Kind of talking about how like it sort of, sort of saying like, no, no, no. Yeah. Like, gay thing all of those things are fine prostitutes are fine like the, and the, the the evil is the killer but then you even there it's like showing the two readings right yeah the author's intent was showing the killer as the bad and everything else is fine and then everyone else seeing oh the killer's intent is to get rid of the bad right and then you also see the third interpretation which is uh maybe more peter neal's which is more of a selfish act. Um, and we start with like the opening quote uh, where someone's reading and then they toss the book into the fire, mm -hmm. um, where it's an act, act of annihilation on all obstacles. Um, and we see that for Peter in the way that he's like annihilating all obstacles. And that's more like self-centered uh, and less maybe symbolic than the other two actual motives. And it's more just like he uh, he's tc's jane and bulmer um as sort of like these uh things that are humiliating him mm -hmm. uh, similar to the girl in red hills and uh he's going to annihilate it he sees an opportunity to annihilate it. so you have that third op uh interpretation as well yeah that's true um so i i like that part i feel like that's an unusual thing to see in a giallo that you like unusually in depth, especially for something like an Argento film, which so often is like more about style and uh, gloss. And this film certainly has that too, but it also has that extra layer going on too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, anything you wanted to bring up to talk about uh, that you had thought of? Uh, there's also, of course, the set pieces that uh, we can get into. Um, yeah, let's just go, to, just let's uh, just jump into the set pieces. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, if uh, if someone ever uh, takes inspiration from the film to film podcast and is like, oh, this is like some inspiration to do some murders. What's what's your move? Are you gonna are you going to assume like, oh, great, I got some I got some murders I got to do too. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna just hop onto this bandwagon and and do it. You like are like you do shove like an iPhone into someone's mouth and it's just like playing film to film while you flash their throat. <laughs> what's your move? <laughs> well, film to film is not. Uh... <laughs> yeah, God damn it! You, you I, I'm, I'm, I'm print overly... out your outline. <laughs> I'm, I'm overly, you I'm overly analytical, so obviously <laughs> I'm, I'm about to ruin the the question by saying in film to film we actually do not come up with killing ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, so, no. so, so no yeah. one would be able to inspire. <laughs> we cannot inspire someone to kill someone. Uh, <laughs> That's true. I, I don't know how someone would would take it. Uh, we do we do talk about violent films in film we, we do we do, but they're the ones who come up with the ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's this like at first I thought this film was gonna work a little bit similar to uh, Seven, in the Killing. Mm-hmm. Because uh, for the, for the first kill that you see in camera, like what, the first yeah the first kill we see is, you know the killer is shoving uh, the pages of a shoplifted book into someone's mouth, right? Right. Before mm -hmm. uh, cutting her throat. But then, the killer didn't do any of that later. I thought that would have been an interesting thing to happen. You know, like. Had, like if the killer had done something like that with uh, the couple later well you know they may have uh i mean like they're taking photos and there was a ritualistic element to it but then the killer got cut off because they uh got killed so i don't know i mean you could like the first ki killer cristiano berti uh is kind of like seven i'm glad you bought it brought up i think that's a fair comparison to make um but i mean this film kind of twi uh twists in a way that uh swerves uh, in a way that you don't necessarily expect. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, like with the lesbian couple, he he had to run away. I forget. Uh, what did he do? Uh, 
No, I, th- I feel like no. he just kind of killed both of them and just left them there, took pictures, and then left. Uh, okay, left them... he didn't leave any pages or anything like that? No. Because okay. he sent something about, like, Lesbos to Peter? Oh, yeah, yeah, he did say, but yeah, but he sent that to, directly to his apartment, to wherever he was staying. Mm, mm-hmm. Which his assistant got and sent it to, and gave it to the police. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Because, um, I mean, okay, I'm not, now I'm trying to remember the kills, so you got... So, yeah, I got him down. We got first kill, shoplifter, uh, shoving papers into the mouth, and then sort of a razor kill. Mm -hmm. Uh, Second kill was also a razor. Uh, It's the double kill. We get that crane shot. Uh, It slices through uh, the cheek, which is a really memorable image that does stick in your face, uh, in your head, uh, just sort of that sheet being torn. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she decides to put her shirt on at a very exploitive moment, uh, take her shirt off at a very exploitive moment, and then they kill her, uh, her partner, um, who is uh, wandering down the stairs, and uh, her head falls through sort of the back glass, right. um, sort of like Suspiria style. So those are the third one. The fourth one is uh, the dog attack, uh, where we get the axe. And so those are the four committed by Bertie. But, but the, four, uh, the fourth one is not uh, a... Thought out. No. A, a sin-related kill. In fact, uh, exactly. the killer feels bad because the fourth one was, you know, he kind of had to do it to carve his ass yes exactly um which that one actually is kind of a, a more gruesome because you a kill because of the use of the axe the first yes. use of the axe yes in fact uh peter neal's kills are are considerably more brutal in general than uh bertie's because mm-hmm. he uses that axe uh a lot yeah i mean I prefer getting my 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 throats probably, I mean slit or something or you know just cut my jugular than you know getting axed on the back or you know like losing my arm my arm or or in the head <laughs> in the head. Well, the head yeah. could be quick though. That's true. That's true. Um, it looks it looks horrific though. Um, so, anyways, uh, your what was your point there? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, Cristiano Berti, he had the potential to be a seven level figure, but he wasn't as creative as John Doe mm-hmm. was in that film. Um, didn't quite have the chops for it. Uh, it was not Kevin Spacey enough. Did you want to talk about any of those kills? Maybe the dog attack? The dog attack was random. The dog attack was one of the most ridiculous things in the film, uh, right up there with uh, him biking to the airport at the beginning. I know, uh, yeah. I, 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 at some moment, I we, we to... had to mention that at some moment. Uh, I wasn't sure when it was yeah. going to come up. I think he, uh, Mike McGinn got this guy's spirit after he got killed. Because <laughs> like, that guy got to be really into biking to the airport if mm-hmm. he's going to... Uh... I mean, he was biking on a fucking U.S. freeway. freeway. I mean... <laughs> Uh, it was <laughs> it was hilarious. I was literally like wondering, like, how did they shoot this? Like, I mean, like... well, I mean, I don't know if you saw, but he had uh, he he had the guy driving behind him and stuff. And yeah, no, no, he, but of course, yeah, because I mean, the, yeah. the the driver gives him all this crap. It's kind of like um, uh, I was gonna say something political, but anyways, yes, uh, it it. it so that was very silly, and the dog, the dog uh, attack was silly. The do- but the dog attack, I, I I literally feel like the writer or director or both were like, how- it's the same person. So perfect. It's Argento. So Argento yeah. was like, how do we get her to get into this man's mansion? Oh, I know. A random dog was is gonna come out of nowhere jump a giant fence and attack her <laughs> yeah her i mean jump a fence too not to mention that was like the michael jordan of dogs i mean that dog was like crazy uh, <laughs> I know. uh um yeah no it, it was kind of funny i mean that was like a weird dober doberman uh just <laughs> what, what what's what's tricky about dog attacks is it works really well, like if if you're using a dog to kill the person, like uh, it happened with uh, in Suspiria. Uh, Suspiria, yeah. 
but if it's just for me ma- aiming uh, like maiming or you know hurting the person uh you needed a lot more work on the fucking makeup especially like the leg and everything because after she gets brutally bitten on the leg arms etc then as she's running away it almost seems like she had a little bit of ketchup on her leg and arm and that's about it yeah this is probably accurate too uh okay so we got we got some uh, nathaniel peeking in here i uh, give him a little bit of uh nitpicks i mean i'm talking about like stylistically yeah 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 like fair enough yeah i mean could have, they could have used a little bit more i mean if you I mean, even no, have the dog attack a dog attack is fucking brutal right i mean the thing is definitely the most ridiculous plotted thing in in the film uh because like the dog attacks which is super random yeah, and then she ends up in the killer's house, which the only thing that kind of excuses it, but I don't think it excuses it, is that they do determine that the killer, uh, the house is like three blocks from where um, uh, uh, the author is staying. So right. it makes sense in that sense, but it still feels very, very thin as far as like uh, a plotting um, device. And, right, and the film makes sure to show you that the killer forgot his keys in the, on the door beforehand. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, and I mean, all right. Yeah. F- ignoring the dog attack itself, I mean, I, in one way though, the dog attack and it's probably one of the more terrifying scenes in the film. Like if you think about it, right? Like it's, it's random yeah. as hell, but I mean, it's it's one of the more terrifying things. I think it's executed decently well, and it's very um, patient. Uh, Argento really takes his time on the way that sequence does play out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, for sure. And and then when once a girl gets in there, you know, it clearly shows that she's a smart she's a smart character, and that she figures out, oh, this is the house of a killer, or probably the killer in the news, and she just starts taking all the evidence, getting ready to, you know. Yeah, it did help that he had all the he had a specific evidence room. True. He's uh his developing room. Yeah. Yeah. Um on the other hand though, I, I, I don't know. I mean it, it, it was a good scene. Uh it, it it's a scene used to move the plot forward and it, it works well. Like I mean it's pretty seamlessly but for the randomness of the dog. Yes, the random is the dog and just like the house location that she wanders into. Uh, yeah, I think I think Argento, the script writer, didn't do a great job. Argento, the director, did a good job with the uh, poor stuff that Argento, the script writer, served up to. Me. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it would have been interesting if uh, she was just like, I mean, because we don't know this girl, right? She's a random girl. Or is this the... No, she's the assistant. Uh, she's like the daughter of the hotel owner, owner. I think. Okay. So, yeah, it, it would have been funnier or more interesting if, like, instead of having a random her fighting with her boyfriend, dude in motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> instead of that, like, you know, because she's supposed to be like a teenage, right? Teen- a teen- I think teenager. so. So, like... It, you know, teenagers being teenagers, just like breaking and entering, maybe to steal some booze, and then encounter the the pictures. That would have been more. You don't have the funness of the dog, but it would have been yeah, yeah. more. It, it's almost just like Argento wanted an excuse to have a dog attack. He yeah. maybe maybe he liked how well it was received in Suspiria, and he wanted to follow up on the cats getting tossed on people from inferno he's like yeah we got to do something with the animal in this film uh yeah let's let's get the uh let's get the uh, michael jordan of dogs uh have him scale some fences and and run after uh, this poor actress <laughs> really um, which which yeah it, i mean and, and those films the plot doesn't matter so you get away with it but this one uh it I feels feel out like of it, place it does Exactly. It, it stands out a bit as being like a little bit, okay, Argento, uh, <laughs> you really wanted to get a, a dog attack in here, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, I, I will say I laughed out loud when, they, when things were happening. <laughs> I, and I think that's a very fair laugh out loud there. <laughs> it's pretty absurd uh, what happens. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the other thing you brought up there uh, that just reminded me, too, is the killer forgets the keys. So we do see who would have been uh, the fourth victim. Um, it looked like he was going to bring up a uh, prostitute mm-hmm. uh, and do it. And it's interesting. Uh, those uh, misogyny tra- charges certainly would very closely apply to uh, sort of his uh, his killing. Yeah. No, yeah. for sure. And I mean, like, and that's a, the that's a part, like, right? It's like the movie is sort of going back to that dialogue between uh, the killer and the other killer, if you will. The writer and, and the... Mm-hmm. And the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, and the uh, yeah yeah the uh, re- TV show guy the t- TV show guy um, you know like one saying no it's com- like you shouldn't be killing like all these people are completely fine and are part of society and they're not aberrations at all and while Bertie is like I'm a Catholic but I am for gay marriage therefore I should be killed myself <laughs> almost <laughs> you're right I mean, there's some interesting uh, dialogue. It's not really very explored to there. Um, like, I also remember when he, uh, Peter Neal is talking to Tilda, uh, the journalist uh, who accuses him of misogyny. He's like, I support the equal rights uh, voting and stuff like that. Oh, the no, the um, Equal Rights Amendment. So that that yeah. was like the, that was the thing in the U.S. right then. Okay. Well, there you go. It's like, like these, he's like a nice liberal guy um, is, is kind of what he hides behind. Um, for that attack so it's kind of interesting yeah i mean it, it, it no that it, that is interesting it's kind of like it's almost like uh thinking modern horror like get out yeah when you, uh, exactly yeah good when, point yeah. when you have the dad saying like oh you know if obama could run a third time i would have voted for him yeah there you go it's like these uh quote-unquote progressives um but also harboring these sort of like more under the surface uh Pretty horrific views. Um, yeah, like so Puritan bullshit. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I think those parts are kind of fun to dig into too. Um, okay, so moving on to the next attack. So those are all of Bertie's attacks, and now these are Peter Neal's. Uh, we get Cristiano Berti, uh, mm-hmm. who gets an axe in the head uh, mm-hmm. at his house. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Neal somehow gets back and knocks himself out with the stone. Uh, probably that would be like the second or third most ridiculous thing that happens in the film. I mean, that, um, that's classic, like cl- classic slasher thing. You know, yeah. the, the killer did, can did, teleport. Yeah. Did you catch on to that uh, and make it, make you suspicious of Peter Neal? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that's kind of, uh, it's like, uh, I was watching the commentary for this film and they made the point that it's like, yeah, you know, if Argento wants someone to get knocked in the head with the rock, He's going to show you. He's going to show that person get knocked in the head with a rock in a, an extreme close up or something like that. Uh, he's not going to do it off screen. I was like, oh yeah, that that, that that's that's a fair point. Uh, that would definitely be a clue for that. Um, I initially didn't pick up on that at all on my initial viewing, but mm. uh, you know, uh, it makes sense. Um, then we also have uh, John Saxon who gets knifed in public. Yep. Uh, Bulmer. Uh, then we have uh, Johnny getting strangled. Uh, and he so, sort of is having his like jello moment where he's like, I think I missed something. Sorry, you so have something be, to say? Before, before, yeah, before we move out of uh, John Saxon, mm-hmm. at that moment, do you think, who do you think was a killer? Because uh, he's supposed to meet up with someone. We assume it's going to be Jane. Mm-hmm. You have this lovely scene where he's looking at, like saying hi to a child, looking at people arguing, looking at a bar fight. And then he gets stabbed, right? But he gets stabbed by someone he was looking forward to seeing. And then you see the red shoes walking mm-hmm. towards it and then walking away. Did you think at that moment, did, did that work as a red herring uh, for you that it could be Jane, the killer? Uh, well, you know, the first time I watched this film was over a year ago. So I don't think so. Uh, I think I was mainly just confused at that point. Um, but I thought Jane was too obvious. Yeah, for sure. As a killer, yeah. But I mean, I, I think I think it could have worked as a as a red herring, in, in the sense that um, you don't know who he was looking forward to seeing. Whoever he mm-hmm. saw, and that killed him. At first, he smiles to that person, so it could have been right. Jane. Yeah, it's clearly someone he recognized. Yeah, uh, right. 
So, I mean, it could have been Jane. I mean, at certain points, I feel like Argento kind of goes through the motions of cre- making everyone a red herring. Mm-hmm. Like, at one point, Anne has kind of a weird phone call with Jane, too. That's a little curt. And you're like, oh, maybe it's Anne. Uh, right. Which is, again, yeah. like one of those uh, giallo tropes. Tropes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Which, I mean, I, I enjoy those tropes mm-hmm. to it. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, you know, Bulmer's killing is... It's not the best one in the film, but it's interesting. It's kind of like broad daylight. Uh, that one is a knife, I think. Yep. It's just a simple yep. stab. Mm-hmm. And then Johnny was strangled from behind. Uh, Johnny is kind of having his moment that most uh, Jello pro- protagonists have. Um, I think this film's interesting in the sense that like the killer is the protagonist, mm-hmm. um, but also it's like it sort of plays around with who you should attach yourself to uh, in the film. Like Johnny is having that moment where he's like, something is happening here and I can't quite think of it. And then he finally has the moment where he realizes um, Bertie is the one that uh, is the initial killer. Um, and uh, and uh, whoever killed him uh, kind of took their place. Right. Um, and so, um, yeah, that I mean, that killing is pretty straightforward too, kind of like the John Saxon one. Sort of sets us up for the very gruesome uh, finale. Um <laughs> which I assume we will talk about. Um, so the finale, a- anything to talk about of uh, Johnny or John or Bulmer? No, I, mean, I think I mentioned uh, enough about Bulmer. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the conclusion uh, starts with Jane sort of by the window uh, with her gun. Uh, she's obviously worried uh, after, after probably seeing Bulmer get stabbed. Mm-hmm. And uh, then a, uh, then a, the, an axe comes in and just like chops off her arm with a gun and it, and it just like uh just st- sprays like the whole white wall uh just like globs of blood all over the place uh and uh uh and then she uh gets killed by an axe yep. um that i think that is most people's favorite murder of the film uh and it's definitely a moment of pretty uh glorious style mm-hmm just seeing all that red blood um, on white. Yeah, no, I mean uh, the 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 amount of blood that is just squirting out of you know the the arm is uh, just funny. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, that... I, I mean, I I always wonder like with other films, right? Like I think of like did Tarantino watch this? Was this where, you know, Kill Bill's uh, reigning arms comes from? You know, like... Uh, T- Tarantino is on the record as saying this is his favorite kill of all time. Okay, so, so, yes. so yes. yes, the 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 arms that are squirting blood everywhere in, in Kill Bill come from this. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I think Argento is the ultimate jello person, too, is like he has just a real knack for imagery Mm -hmm. and some of these images just stick with you and i think this film has some of uh his best ones like that that shot of her spraying all over the the wall the white wall that's going to stick with you uh stuff like the sheet being opened up and uh and i think those are part of the reasons this film um is pretty memorable for myself at least yeah yeah uh um so that's followed up with uh with Altieri, uh, walking in, who is the second detective. We've hardly talked about the detectives in these films, but they actually play pretty big roles uh, for a giallo film, which tends not to focus too much on police. Um, she walks in. She looks a lot like Anne. That's mm-hmm. sort of established early on. We see her wearing a very similar uh, sort of suit to Anne and Peter Neal wearing a very similar outfit to uh, the, de- the detective um, mm-hmm. at the beginning. Um, and so he axes her thinks it's Anne, and so he starts to get sad. Right. Um, but then he realizes it's not. Uh, but then uh, Anne and the detective walk in, and uh, and they they were like, oh, shit, uh, it's Peter. Um, and he fake kills himself with the razor mm-hmm. um, and, and he manages to uh, trick the detective uh, to going back out to his car and then coming back. And then there's that one shot where... Uh, the detective is there and Peter Neal's right behind him and the blocking of it is done in such a way that when uh, the detective goes down to check out a piece of evidence, Peter Neal, you see him and then the detective gets axed to death Uh, and then after all this carnage, he knocks this funny sculpture uh, reminiscent of Bird with the Crystal Plumage Mm -hmm. uh, around and 
uh, when Anne walks in, he goes in for the final kill, and all of this destruction leads to him just ending up getting killed himself by this structure. Yep. Uh, and Anne just screaming her, her head off uh, at the end. Um, again, on one hand, this is one of the longer endings that you have in... Uh, in a in an Argento film, in the sense that it stays with you, right? The man is is not like, oh, the building is burning, freeze frame or something. No, he is stabbed. She is screaming. Like he, like he's impaled by this uh, piece of art while she's screaming, and you 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 have that there for a solid minute, which again I think uh, brings a lot of enjoyment. Uh, I guess, you know, he's dead. Uh, he's kind of moving a little bit, but not really, and bleeding a lot. And, um, and I mean, I, I laughed there, too. That, that was another moment of laughter for me. <laughs> me, too. Me, too. Um, I I think the ending is almost just perfect for me. Yeah. Uh, like her just screaming at the end. I thought that was a great way to end it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that scream, I think she does a great job screaming. She said in the past, Daria Nicolodi, who also put, was in Deep Red um, and who was Argento's partner, mm -hmm. she made it sound like it was a very frustrating film to do. And she was just getting out all of her uh, anger <laughs> at that last shot and just screaming her, her ass off. Uh, and I mean, I'll give it to her. <laughs> her acting in this film is fine, um, but uh, the last shot, I think, is, is really good. I mean, it was a very frustrated scream, actually. Now, now that you bring it up, because it was a little bit strange. It was just like very loud and very like guttural scream from her end. And, <laughs> and, and now I understand. It's just like, I am so frustrated with this project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I think it's great. I mean, I love the end. I think it's great. I think it's unusual for these giallos to kill, end with like such a uh, sort of like orgy of violence. Um, but this one really does, and I think it pulls off uh, pulls it off super well. I mean, I don't know how unusual it is. I mean, we've had a lot of giallos that end with, uh, what was it? There was the one with the man who gets dragged by, well, well that was not technically the ending, but... Uh, the one with the man being dragged by the car and then getting hit by another car and then getting, you know... <laughs> his face run over. His face run over. You got the priest that, you know, gets... Which dummy yeah, yeah. gets constantly being hit by rocks as he's falling. But body count-wise, uh, there's like... We're on the same set. We have Jane die. We have Altieri die. Uh, we have the other detective die. Fair. And then we have Peter Neal die. So that's four people uh, in one setting. Yeah. Um, in the span of like, I don't know, five minutes. Um, yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think just more body count wise, but you're right. It's like there are some certainly memorable endings that are pretty unforgettable, like D D Duckling. I, I think you mentioned the priest. Mm -hmm. That one's good. Uh, love that one. Uh, and there's some nice, uh, nice touches in a lot of these ones. Nice dummy work. Yes, yes. No dummies in this one, I don't think. Uh, just a dummy arm. Oh, yes. With a gun? <laughs> Definitely a dummy arm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So where, where do you land on the conclusion? Or do you like it uh, as much as I do? Oh, no. It's a great conclusion. I mean, I mean, my favorite is probably his death. Um, yeah. The, the, uh, I mean, the chopped arm scene is... is uh, The blood is amazing. And, and part of me is like, oh, too bad I saw Kill Bill already. Because, like, clearly Tarantino, you know, was heavily inspired by it. Yeah, uh, because seeing this, if this was my first time seeing it, I would have been shocked and surprised, and yeah, you know, um, yeah, and I think one shot that does get like a little watered down just because it's been done now uh, is the part of the blocking where the detective oh, yeah. goes down and we see him right behind. Just yeah. because I, I I suspect this was at least early, if not the first, to do something like that, mm -hmm. and now we've seen that before, so it's uh, it. Uh, it lessens the impact a little bit. At least. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, anything else in this film uh, you would like to highlight now that we've kind of uh, worked our way through it? No, I think uh, we sort of work together on highlighting the, the fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to add that I also liked was the whispering. Uh, I, I, I just liked uh, the, the tone of the dubbing there. Uh, spy! Yeah, I, that's the most... It's spy! 
Yeah. Uh, well, that, well, that brought a smile to my face, too. <laughs> what other things would he say? I mean, yeah, the, the whispering was... Pervert. <laughs> Filthy pervert. Slimy pervert. Because it was whispering, like, that's the part where, you know, it made me think, it could be a woman, the killer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Argento's good at, like, keeping it sort of gender neutral in that way. Yeah. I mean, he has he has a number of woman killers in uh, his films. I think half of the films we've watched so far of his uh, have woman killers, of his giallos. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll know we've made it on film to film when we start to get threatening voicemails like that. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> I, we got long, long ways yeah, to go. Is, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, let's let's finish up then. Uh, who won the movie? Um, hmm. I, I can go if you want. Yeah, you can uh, go first. Okay, I, I, I got to give it to Dario Argento. I think he's the creative force behind this, and I think he's responsible for most of the good qualities as well as uh, the few bad qualities that this film does of have. Course, yeah. And so I think his uh, fingerprints are all over this. So going to give it to him. Um, yeah, I could make a case for Francioska too, who I think is really good, but that's who I'd give it to. All right, then I'll give it to Francioska. Francioska. Okay. <laughs> Fran- is it Franciosa or... Uh, Anthony uh, Franciosa? Yeah, I don't know. It's Italian, so. Anthony Franciosca. I think, uh, right there, Franciosa. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. Okay. The, the, we're using caption in our communication, so the caption is spelling it correctly as I'm saying it. So there we go. Yeah, it must be right then. <laughs> All right. And um, so rating, and I also just wanted to ask, now that we've sort of talked about it, where do you sort of place this uh this is, I think, we've done a lot of Argento films in this, in uh, film to film. He's definitely one of our most covered filmmakers. Um, this is, I believe, the seventh Argento film uh, we've done. Mm-hmm. So where do you place this uh, sort of on his filmography? Is it like at the top, um, sort of in the middle? Hmm. I would say on the upper half. Okay. Yeah. And rating? Um, high seven, low eight. Low, okay. Like low eight, low eight. Okay, gotcha. And if you had to, so just to unpack that slightly more, if you had to watch Deep Red or this, which what are you picking? Ooh, they're they're very different. Okay, they are. Yeah, they are. Um, depends on my mood. Okay. I think this one almost moved faster than Deep Red. Uh, I think it might. There's more kills. It's it's and it's actually I think shorter than it too. Yeah. So I yeah it feels very breezy, uh, especially once you sort of get to that last half. So more likely to watch this one again. Okay. What about versus like uh, Suspiria or Inferno? Um. Well, I do want to watch Inferno again at some moment. Mm-hmm. So that one, I actually really like that one for some reason. I do too, yeah. You know, I mean, Deep Red and Suspiria are what everyone's seen for Argento, but I think you could make sort of a case that, like, Inferno and uh, Tenebrae are just as worthy mm-hmm. as sort of like the the hipster contrarian picks. But I think they're just as good of films, personally. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I, I just really... I think I liked uh, Inferno more than Suspiria, personally, but... Um... I, th- I think we both did actually yeah. uh, to some extent. I mean, I I really like Suspiria, but uh, I don't know. Inferno hit works for me just as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, uh, this film, uh, this stretch of films for Argento uh, are pretty much all ten out of tens for me. I, I'm a big fan of them. Um, uh, this film, on initial watch, I liked it a little bit less, um, and uh, you know, it was like a nine out of ten. Now it's a ten out of ten for me, nice. um, and that's. I think it's just uh, as, kind of as a product of becoming more familiar with all of Argento films as well as uh, just Giallo in general mm-hmm. and just appreciating a lot of the thought that went into this. Not a perfect movie by any means, but um, I think for me it's at least um, a, a 10 out of 10. Nice. All right. Well, um, 
you can uh, tweet at us at ZA Film to Film. Uh, you can send us an email too at ZA Film to Film at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, we will see y'all in two weeks. See you guys in, the, in two weeks. Ciao. Ciao.